Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of A Good Show. On this evening's episode, we will commence the investigative series into the COVID-19 vaccination in the Cayman Islands, asking the question, was it safe and effective? Joining us, we have from the United States, Dr. Peter McCullough. Dr. Michael McDowell comes in from Trinidad and our very own Dr. Stevenson Tomlinson. Dr. McCullough, would you please um, introduce yourself for the public's benefit? It's a pleasure to join this esteemed group. I'm Dr. Peter McCullough, practicing internist, cardiologist, research epidemiologist in Dallas, Texas. I see patients every day uh, in my clinical practice. I'm very involved in academic publication on the pandemic, and I've brought the world the very first multi-drug treatment protocol, McCullough Protocol, published in the American Journal of Medicine, and now the first detoxification protocol for patients with long COVID and vaccine injury syndromes, published in the Springer uh, Nature uh, Journal, Curious. Uh, you know, I have been a public commentator on the pandemic throughout uh, the last four years on the major U.S. media, international media. I've testified in the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, European Parliament, Brazilian um, Chamber, as well as so many uh, houses of governmental leadership around the world. And it's a pleasure to join this group today. Thank you kindly. Now, Dr. Uh, Michael McDowell, Please share with us some of your background. Yes, hi, Katina. Well, um, I must say I am not a medical doctor. My doctorate is in theology. I have a, a, a THD in theology. And I'm a senior pastor. I've been a senior pastor for the last... I'm the founding and senior pastor of a church called Rafa Revival Ministries uh, for the last 32 years. And I'm also an eschatologist. My specialty in theology is in the area of the end times and the second coming of Christ, and I lecture globally on the fact on, on eschatology. I've touched uh, most of the nations in the world. I think the only area I haven't been to heavily is, is the European area. But I first became aware of when I heard that Bill Gates wanted to vaccinate the entire world with an mRNA genetic uh, a genetic vaccine. It, it it rang bells in my mind concerning the theology of Genesis six verses one to four. And, this, and I saw that as a, an attempt, another attempt, because an attempt was made in, in, in the antediluvian earth to change the genome of the entire human race. So that clued me off and I began to do a lot of research. I have a, a, a background in science. I, have done, I did biology at McMaster University. So, so those, the, the theology and the biology tied together. And I have been trying to uh, share what my concerns ever since. I'm, by the grace of God, I've been able to be in touch with persons like yourself, Katina, and of course, the esteemed Dr. McCullough, and now, of course, Dr. Tom Vincent. So it's a joy to be here. Thank you. Stranger to the Cayman population, um, our very own Dr. Stevenson Tom Vincent, please.
vaccination programs and so on. Um, Dr. McCullough, would you care to explain to us what um, informed consent really means? What its well, definition it, means? It, informed consent is uh, considered a cornerstone of clinical care and biomedical research. In fact, it's memorialized in the Declaration of Helsinki. But informed consent means that the participant who the patient who's going to receive care uh, under no circumstances receives any pressure, coercion or threat of reprisal for either receiving or not receiving the therapy or participating in the research. It means that they fully understand the risk, uh, both the known risks and the theoretical risks of the treatment or the vaccine, and, and that they can weigh that against the theoretical benefit of the vaccine applied. And, and I think our group will, de will deliberate this, but I can tell you the COVID-19 vaccines initially only had two months of observation on treatment and then another month of, of follow-up uh, from the initial series. So no one was fully informed of what the longer term safety or efficacy data would ever show. The, the trials were simply too short to provide full informed consent once somebody took the vaccine. No one would know what would happen six months later. Yes. So, um, Dr. Uh, either any of you actually can um, speak to this. The, the mode for clinical trials sometimes can take decade, a decade, three years, five years, 10 years in order to get a vaccine through um, to FDA approval if it follows the right procedure. Are you able to elaborate on what that procedure is? Or give us some insight about how it is um, it goes, the process it goes through. Well, be, before Dr. Dr. Tomlinson takes this, because that's, this is not really in my field, but what, let me just mention that what alarmed me most of all was the fact that um, there was something called Operation Warp Speed launched for the production of the vaccines. And I think the general public was uh, uh, alarmed from the fact that vaccines could be rushed through so quickly, knowing that it takes uh, years to perfect the vaccine and to get everything right. And the, the rush was very alarming to most people. And so right from the onset, there were, there were questions about the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. So I defer to Dr. Tomlinson. Now, you know, yes. whenever, whenever there's a new drug or even equipment in medicine that is um, that um, negated, um, um, am I, are you hearing me? Yes, we are, Dr. Tomlinson. There is normally a process um, that um, has to be gone through. Um, number one, of course, you have to have participants and so on, and often you have to um, um, advertise and see if um, anyone would like to join the uh, research that's being conducted. And it, it has to be explained to, to them properly. As Dr. McCulloch said, you know, what are the risks, if any, is known at that point, um, the majority of people, for example, if it's a drug uh, to treat cancer, um, the majority of people who participate, the majority of times they have gone through, um, you know, they've tried various treatments that are currently available. And um, perhaps uh, uh, as, as a last resort, quite often they decide, well, you know, since I'm in this position, I may as well try and be part of this trial. And um, um, of course, uh, they have to uh, do this voluntarily. And uh, often uh, the investigator that's conducting such research, you know, all, says clearly that if something happens to the individual, you know, that um, um, everyone will do their, in, their very best to help the person. Um, uh, sometimes people, of course, end up having side effects from the drugs. And worse than that, uh, some people are, are permanently um, harmed. 
And all of these things are taken into account. And at any rate, um, the, the individual is in some way compensated. And uh, um, uh, there are various um, stages of research. Uh, and finally, uh, along, you know, the, the various stages have to uh, be um, uh, go, gone through. Um, one uh, at the beginning, uh, the research is conducted uh, principally on animals first. And um, if they don't have any untoward side effects, uh, then small groups of people are invited to participate. And um, uh, if they don't have uh, too many um, adverse side effects, then larger groups and sometimes multi-center trials, meaning that it's not just one center that's conducting the trial, but different centers in different parts of the world or even in a specific country, um, are, they're also participating in, in the trial. And uh, finally, uh, the, the uh, research is um, presented and uh, not uh, final in the final stages, of course, it is presented. And even uh, as the research progresses, um, it is presented in the case of the United States, say to the FDA and in, in, depending on um, the, over, the, the body that um, oversees research, you know, in the United Kingdom, it's the MHRH. And uh, here in the Cayman Islands, of course, it would be the Health Practice um, Commission. So at the end of the day, the, the research um, is either approved in that um, the, um, the researchers are given a marketing license. This, the important thing to know is that this doesn't take um, a day or two or even a year. The majority of time, this goes on for many years. And um, this was not the case, as you know, with um, the vaccines. And I agree with Dr. McCulloch, there was some concern because of how fast um, the vaccines were produced. But what I must say is that I know as a fact that the actual technology was known um, long before the warp speed began. Dr. McCulloch might like to elaborate on that uh, later on, um, but uh, definitely, uh, it didn't go through the trials as normally um, one would have expected. Does that answer your question? I hope it at least throws a little light on it. It, it does. Um, and I think that the viewing public certainly appreciated um, your explanation of how, how vaccines are tested and proven and, and how um, the engagement with the human being is actually uh, deployed. So these protocols are actually a result of the, um, the Nuremberg trials, which brought us the Nuremberg Code because of what was ha what happened back in Nazi Germany. And I and I am sure to put the word Nazi in because not every German was a Nazi, and not every German. Uh, agreed with what was happening in the Holocaust and so that distinction needs to be made that it was the Nazi, um, Nazism um, that was happening in the, in Germany um, and and so the Nuremberg I think it started with the T4 program back in 1936 with hit which was a Hitler um, orchestrated program and it did testing on on euthanasia of um, the elderly, disabled, in other words, the useless leaders. And, and um, as a result of that medical scientific experimentation and the Holocaust itself and all of what happened during the Holocaust, um, following the, the um, end of the Second World War, we had the Nuremberg trials and the Nuremberg trials caused what is now known in the medical industry to, to have the Nuremberg Code created. And, and it is this Nuremberg Code that set the, um, the principles for um, medical procedures. Is that correct? Thank you. Now, a part of um, what came out also from, from the as a result of the Second World War was the um, 
creation of the United Nations and its charter on fundamental freedoms and, and rights and the responsibilities of government towards its citizens. And at Article 4 of the ICCPR, um, we have where uh, individuals cannot be subjected without his free consent to medical or scientific experimentation. Now we, we can say, my apologies, we can say that um, I, I think it can be agreed that the COVID-19 vaccination being deployed in a way that it was uh, globally and with the warp speed that it was deployed, having not gone through the proper testing protocols as you set out, Dr. Tomlinson, and as agreed by Dr. McCullough, it, it was a medical experiment. Your thoughts on that? It definitely was an experiment, and they, they only got a license for experimental use, as you know, in the beginning. Dr. McCullough, can you speak to some of um, the, the Emergency Use Act? Um, can you speak yeah. to some? Thank you. Most of the world actually followed the regulatory guidance of uh, the United States, and I imagine Cayman is, is no different. So the US FDA set the standard. Now there is a, uh, a regulatory uh, procedure called emergency use authorization. It had been used about a dozen times previously, but exclusively for the US military for various products, including the anthrax vaccine. Emergency use authorization had never been used for a public product. And what it says is that if there is no other alternative and there is a national emergency, which there was declared by former President Trump, and there's a public health emergency declared by our Health and Human Services Director, that in fact, this um, regulatory pathway could be, um, you know, could be invoked. A product could be emergency use authorized. So in the United States, all the products, starting with uh, remdesivir, uh, and then bamalivimab, and then the vaccines were all emergency use authorized. And, and what that meant is uh, they skipped a lot of key regulatory steps. Uh, we, we had no idea if these were gonna work or not gonna work, but there's nothing in the regulatory uh, law that says that people have to take it. This is very important. Uh, and when these vaccines were rolled out, they weren't rolled out with risk stratification. What should have happened in even in the most dire circumstances, only those at high risk for hospitalization and death should have ever been offered a vaccine. But what we saw happen was just the opposite. There was quickly a focus on young people, uh, those who had uh, no threat of having hospitalization and death, uh, pa patients who already had the illness and, and could have, have no benefit from a vaccine. Uh, they were offered the vaccine and then shortly after that forced into it. And then sadly, we saw pregnant women and, and children. So uh, the emergency use authorization uh, for the first time for public use turned out to be a disaster. Now, Dr. McDowell, is that um, what the, Dr. McCullough was seeing in the United States? Was that pretty much what you were observing over in Trinidad as well? Yes, yes, I believe so. You know, one of the things that Dr. McCullough just said that really um, uh, impressed me, touched me, was that uh, the EUA, the Emergency Use Authorization, uh, was done exclusively for, for the military first of all and was never used publicly uh, and I, I heard of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Gerd van den Bosch he was, he's, a form, he's a vaccinologist worked with Gavi and a number of the top uh, vaccinologist uh, uh, companies and one of the things he said very early on was that uh, mass vaccination during a pandemic or mass vaccination at a time of high infectious pressure is a prescription for catastrophe and he warned the world very very early um, at the inception of the vaccine being introduced, that uh, and he published a number of papers on this, Dr. Gerd van den Bosch, that what the world was doing was 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 really a complete the complete antithesis of proper medical practice. So so mass vaccination was ruled out, and one of the things we noted in Trinidad and Tobago very early as well 
was that when when mass vaccination was rolled out uh, i think it was on april 6th if i remember 2021 our our campaigns our vaccination campaign started within two weeks of the rollout of that mass vaccination campaign the graph in trinidad and tobago the the, the graph of deaths in trinidad and tobago spiked precipitously went up with a very steep incline and never stopped and 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 when you examine the the global statistics and the graphs from all around the world it was also found that as soon as as soon as the uh, different countries rolled out the vaccination at different times i think the us rolled out their vaccination in december uh, 2020 and and the other nations followed suit and by around by around march or april 2021 the whole world had rolled out their vac vaccination program but whenever that vaccination program was rolled out within within two weeks of the rollout of the vaccination program the death graph spiked precipitously upward and what and, and in our own country there were lots of uh, graphs shown on the television about, about what's happening with the vaccination and covid 19 but the, but no graph showed the spike in deaths that took place after the vaccination rollout they, no no a very very simple graph but they went to all sorts of complicated graphs to show us different things but they never showed us the death spike that took place which which is obviously correlates the vaccine to the, the, the increased uh, rate of death. Thank you. Now, Dr. Tomlinson, you spoke just now about um, having treated so many people here in Cayman um, after the vaccination program. Were your observations similar to those of Dr. McCullough and Dr. McDowell? The vaccination that um, was given here, I think, uh, was the Pfizer vaccine, and it it became available. Uh, that was in early 2021, I believe. That is when um, they started vaccinating people. And of course, I won't go into um, many of the things that I disagreed with from the very beginning, but um, definitely. Uh, after the the vaccination started, uh, um, this is uh, uh, when we were staying at we were staying long after that was that they opened up. And when they opened up the borders, if you remember, um, that was when there was a big spike in actual cases here in Cayman. Um, the death rate here, uh, that's something that I'm waiting for um, statistically know that for the year uh, 2021, 2022, and even 2023, um, there has been an increase in the Gemini Islands and the Gemini And those statistics will soon be available. I can't say at this point whether um, there was a big spike, a big spike immediately after the rollout of the vaccine um, I, and deaths. That's something that um, I'm, I'm waiting myself to find out more about here in the Cayman Islands. We know we had over 20, it was just over 20 deaths here in the um, in the Cayman Islands. Um, so one of the things that concerned me though, Katina, is that I'm, I'm very concerned about um, the ongoing increase in death rate here in the Cayman Islands. I mean, just um, Saturday gone, we buried a 32 year old man because he had a heart attack. And I think this is something that people need to be um, looking at. Uh, why is it that so many of the younger people are dying? And this this wasn't um, how it was in Cayman in the past. Something has happened. Why we're seeing um, younger people dying mainly um, of heart problems. Um, it's definitely a problem. And it seems like uh, not a lot of people are are looking into it i'm glad that uh, you want to they're cer certainly very concerned and um and there there are definitely other people i know that are concerned we need to um take a special i think um we need to really be looking not just in the increase in, in the death rate but the ages you know um, who is it that is dying that's causing this increase in death rate and um you know what is really causing their death 
So that's something that um, I'm very interested in because it's definite, it's not anecdotal anymore. Um, there is definitely uh, an increase in deaths among the younger population. And um, like I said, one of the main problems that uh, cause their death is um, related to the heart. Well, with having said that, I think that is a good place for us to stop for right now for this episode of A Good Show. Thank you so very much for staying tuned to A Good Show. You have just watched part one of COVID-19 vaccination in the Cayman Islands. Was it safe and effective? Join us again next Sunday for part two of COVID-19 vaccination in the Cayman Islands. Was it safe and effective on a good show? You can watch a good show on Sundays and Tuesdays at 7 p.m. on Cayman Life TV, channel 33 on Logic. Thank you and God bless you. A Good Show is brought to you by the kind donations of private sponsors like yourselves and the support of companies such as Media Warehouse, Seven Miles of Grace, H. Philippi Bank's Attorney at Law, Dragonfly Cayman, and others. To become a sponsor, an advertiser, or to make a donation, email a goodshow at christian.ky.